So one thing I wanted to talk about, I don't, I'm not sure I was 100% clear, and so I want to make sure I am, about the uh, MCS locks. Oh, that's right. We're back to four up landscape. Four up landscape mode as opposed to portrait mode. Yeah, thank you. So the way the MCS locks work is that the API changes, right? So when you do an acquire or release, you provide not only the lock, but you provide a stack-based variable, which is a Q node. So for example, in some kernel function foo, we might declare a Q node and then go ahead and acquire our global lock and then use the lock you know, in our critical section and later on release. All right. And the key here is if we've got some particular <coughs> CPU executing this code, it has its own value for this Q node. Right, if we've got CP core one, CPU one, that's executing this code, I claim it'll have a different value for the address of Q than this one wants. So the address of Q here might be, you know, if we look at main memory, might be here, and the address of Q here would be somewhere else. Why would that be? It's a local variable, yeah. And there's different stacks, right? This would be a stack, and this would be a different stack, right? We either have stacks per thread, like we do in XV6, or we have stacks per CPU, like we do in JOS, but they're separate. And so therefore, what we have, what we end up with is this linked list, right? of queues, which are all on different CPUs and only being read by that one CPU except when you get to the release time. And so that's why we avoid this contention for the cache lines, right? Because we're not all banging on this single lock. We're instead, this guy's sitting here in a choir, looping, looking at its queue value. The next guy looping, looking at its queue value. The next guy lo looping, looking at its queue value. And when this guy does a release, It'll go adjust, get rid of its queue, adjust the value here, and then the guy who was waiting will stop spinning. All right. There are these different uh, locks. It was the, what is it, K12 locks, I think is what they're called, K, K42 locks, which don't share uh, which don't modify the API. So in a K42 lock, you still just do an acquire L and a release L. But they effectively do the same thing by in acquire, they go ahead and allocate a local variable. So they manipulate stuff so that the lifetime of this queue entry needs to only be for the acquire. They don't have to make it also work for the release. Uh, so here were some of the questions. How hard is it to modify existing code to use scalable locks? It depends which scalable locks. Right? If you're using the K42 locks, the API doesn't change, so it doesn't require any changes. If you're using um, these locks, then it, requires a little, it can require a little bit more work. You know, you've got to declare some variable. Right? Sometimes you don't acquire a release in the same function. You acquire in one function and release in another function. That gets to be a little more tricky. Where are you going to put this local variable? If you've got two functions, foo and bar. You've got to put it in some parent function that called both of them, either directly or indirectly, so that its lifetime can last for the entirety of foo and bar. And presumably you've got to 
um, pass pointers to it or something, you know, down the chain. Have kernel developers actually changed the locks they use in response to the paper? Yes. So Linux is a good example. Uh, ticket locks aren't used anymore. Does JOS XV6 use locks only within a CPU or do they share locks between multiple CPUs? So I think, that, so, uh, XV6 will use locks even if you're running on a single CPU because of the fact that threads can be preempted, right? So you could have a thread be preempted while it holds a lock and another one comes in and won't go for that lock. For JOS, locks are only used really between CPUs, right? There's no need to have locks within if you're running on a single CPU system. Right, there doesn't do anything special on a single or multiple CPU, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't need to have locks in that single CPU case. How do we define the critical section which determines the time taken to transfer lock ownership? The critical section, right, the critical section is the part, if we think of it sort of from the end of the acquire to the time So the critical section is here plus whatever that handoff is from when we're done here and the next guy can return from its acquire. And the key thing is we wanted this handoff to be constant, not dependent on the number of waiters. A non-scalable lock uh, is a lock that doesn't scale. Uh, as, as you basically, you don't get a performance drop as you increase the number of cores. You might not get an increase, but you don't get this, this drop off. And the sudden drop off in performance is because, in ticket locks, is right because this handoff is order in, because of these cache lines. Because there's all this contention for this single address, and we have roughly half the contenders go and figure out I don't need to do anything with this until the one where the ticket matches gets to go. So it'd be sort of like, I'm not sure this is a good analogy or not. So how many people have used tickets anywhere where they go and they pick a ticket for the next person? Okay. So imagine, normally they have a place where they show what the current ticket is, right? Imagine they didn't do that instead. Imagine there was a little book where they wrote what the current ticket is, all right? And you had to wait in line to go read the book. And so basically what you do is you go get in line and then you go read the book and say, it's not my turn let. What would you do then? You go back and get in line again, right, in case someone had updated. So when the clerk goes and updates the ticket number, which they, you can't see that they've done that, and you wait again, you don't know that it's your turn until you go through the line of the people in front of you who are looking because everyone's trying to look until you get there. And so that's why we've got this line waiting in the ticket case, okay? In the uh, scalable lock we were looking at, it's a lot more like you have your own piece of paper that says uh, whether you're good to go or not. And you wait until it says you're good to go. And then once you're done, you know the next guy who's waiting and you go over to their tick ticket and write on it, I mean their piece of paper and write on it, now you're good to go. Uh, proportional back off with ticket locks is sort of like uh, proportional back off or exponential back off with um, networking, right? If you've got an ethernet bus that has a lot of contention on it, the thing you don't want to do is keep trying harder and harder and faster and faster to get access to the bus. Instead, what you do is back off. And if you back off and you come back and it's still, you don't get access to it, you back off twice as long and you come back and you back off twice as long okay, to try and reduce contention on all these people, on, on, on all these <coughs> devices trying to access the, the Ethernet bus. In the case of tickets, the same sort of idea. It's not your turn, so back off. And in fact, it's not my turn, and I see that I've got, I'm at Costco, if I see I've got 50 people in front of me, 
I can go ahead and go to the food court, right, and get a pizza and come back, under the theory that it's not going to run a you know 50 head. So that's kind of the idea. This proportional back off. The the closer you are to being at your ticket, the more often you're going to be looking to see whether it's your ticket number. Okay, but setting that up properly and having the right constants, right? What you really do I have enough time to go to the food court to get my pizza? It depends on how fast they're calling the numbers. Right. So. Uh, these are the test programs were pathological in the sense that they did a lot, but what they actually do is not that pathological. So they would represent a busy system. Uh, and I'm going to skip that one and let us go on to RCU. So this is like how can you do concurrent programming without, in some ways, without locks. Okay? So it's, it's kind of lockless, sort of lockless, I guess is what I'm going to, ah, I know the word that I want to use. Lockless ish. Okay? Yes. So we'll talk about what our motivation is and then what exactly RCU is, a little bit of how Linux uses it, summary and questions. So homework six, you remember that one? Ah, oh, yes, homework six, everyone says, I remember that one. That's the one where we had threading. So we had a hash table and we were doing gets and puts into this hash table. Right, so concurrent puts and gets. And we found that if we did concurrent puts and gets without any locking, that we had conflicts. Right? So hash table with chaining, and when you're actually dealing with that linked list and multiple uh, updaters are trying to update the list, you got a problem. So we started out with one big lock for the entire table, and that worked. We used that lock for both puts and gets. So therefore, there was only one reader or one writer ever at a time. So the problem is that's not very performant, right? So then we switched to having one lock per bucket, per linked list. And part of what we did in that is we didn't use the lock for reading. Okay? We just used the lock for writing. And the argument against using it for reading was kind of we'd be OK. Okay, and let's look at that. So let's look, let's assume we have a linked list with concurrent readers. Okay, we've got zero or more readers that are all reading this linked list kind of constantly. And what we want to do is update the list without stopping the readers. Okay. So we want to insert an item. So here's how this looks. Uh, I'm going to zoom in on this one second. All right, so time is progressing to the right. We start out with a simple linked list, one item in it. Okay, the head points to the node that has a key of two and a value of three. Time goes to the right again. Okay, so we're gonna we have a an updater or a writer to this list who's going to add an item at the beginning of the list. So what do you do when you're adding an item to the list? First, you malloc a node. And so we do a malloc. And we've now got a node. What are the values in that malloc node? Undefined. Yeah. We do, are we guaranteed zeros from malloc? No. If we wanted to get zeros, we would use calloc. Well, C, yeah, Cialloc is guaranteed to get zeros. So we don't know what they are. Green means safe. Okay. Safe in that the readers don't see it. Kind of makes sense. You do a malloc, you've got a local pointer, no one can see it. So no problems as far as the reader is concerned. Okay? Next thing we do is initialize to whatever the values we want are. So we know the key and we know the value we want. We put them in there. Can the reader see this? Any readers? No, they can't see it. Can the reader see the head? Yes. Can the reader see this node? Yes. And I assume we got a null. Okay, 
So here's what we do. We, part of the other initialization is we set our next pointer to point to that. Did that hurt anything? No. This guy doesn't know how many things are pointing to it or what's pointing to it, right? But now, in one fell swoop, right, we change the head pointer. Is that one fell swoop? Or is that more than, is it one atomic fell swoop? This is a single 32-bit pointer we're assigning here. And thank goodness, there have been architectures in the past where this isn't true, but thank goodness, on our modern architectures, that is an atomic operation. Okay? So it's not, for instance, that it writes the first eight bytes, sorry, eight bits, and then the next eight bits, and then the next eight bits, and the next eight bits, because that'd be a problem, because then we'd have this mishmash of pointer, old pointer and new pointer. It's either the old pointer, or it's a new pointer. So therefore, now readers see the head now pointing to here, and this correctly points to here. So we successfully updated this without doing any locks and without stopping any of the readers. Okay? Does that make sense? So every reader either sees a linked list with one item in it or two items in it. If they came before here, they see one. If they came after here, they see two. So True. This will be correct for the readers if you issue the read before the write, but if you have uh, in the case that you're doing a write and at the same time <coughs> maybe you kind of issue a read after that and then you need to block that read before the spike completes. Like lock chronos like as time goes by. If you have reads first and then a write. I see how the reads are fine, but can there be a malicious case where Which read happens in the right? You're saying like reordering of things? Yeah. We will get to some issues um, where there need to be some barriers. So for instance, it is important that these three assignments happen before the assignment to head. Would you agree with that? Right? We, we, in our code, did assignment, 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 assignment. Unfortunately, part of the way we get speed on current processors is it is allowed to reorder writes. And so it could actually do this write first and then these three. That would be really bad, wouldn't it? So we actually do need a write barrier okay, to ensure, before we write to head, that this guy happens after any previous writes that have happened. Okay? So that is a, is that sort of the concern you had? Yeah, okay. So that, that is necessary. And that's actually something we're going to talk about more. Does this one make sense? So they see a list with one item and there are two items in it. Uh, and in this particular case, right, you might have a reader who is kind of reads head, and it's a really slow reader, right? So it reads head, and then it takes its time, and it thinks about it, and then eventually it actually indirects through the pointer and goes to here. Now that might have actually indirected after head has already been updated. So you can have a reader who read head earlier hasn't used it yet, and continues to traverse the list. So you can have two readers that are operating here, one of whom thinks there's two element items in the list, and one of whom thinks there's only one item in the list. Make sense? But if that's OK, then this is great, because we don't have to have locks for the reader. Do we have to have writer locks? Yeah, we still have to have writer locks. Unless we come up with some very fancier system, we need to make sure only one writer is adding item to the list at once. So there will be a lock for the writer. We will have a lock for the writer to ensure there's only one writer. Yeah, I was just going to say that if you get this on immediately, we can see why it's necessarily safe that you have two readers and both of them think they're different size linked lists. Is it because it's like nothing bad can happen if you think the linked list is smaller than it actually is? If we're in a hash table, right, and we are looking to see whether an item exists or to get a value for a given key, then 
if we've got a reader that's going through and if it comes in over here and it sees that you know it only, there's only one item, that the guy with the key eight is not there, so it will say not there. If we're okay with it being somewhat stale, and it's not the, true for all algorithms or, or for all use cases, but a lot of use cases, it would be okay that we check and see whether a given key is in the table and it says no, <coughs> even though shortly before there was a uh, insert of that item on a different core. Okay? There's a large cost to make sure that we're completely up to date. We have one memory bus, and we have this whole thing we talked about with our cache lines that ensure only one person is writing at a time, and if they write right into, the into their local cache line, yeah. that any readers will get that value. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so, but it's, still one it's effectively device. serialized, yes. Multiple CPU, but one memory bus model. One, yes, exactly. With a complicated cache to try and make that be faster, but to give the same, same result. result, exactly. All right, let's look at deleting. So for deletion, uh, <coughs> all we really have to do, again, there's only one updater, one writer at a time. Could have multiple readers. So we basically update the head pointer. In this case, if we're deleting the first element. Right? If we're deleting a subsequent element, we would just update that pointer, whatever it is, to skip around it. So once we've done that, this is what new readers will see. There's still a node that exists that still points to here, and there may still be readers that are looking at this. Okay? So any readers that read the head before, in phase one, could be still looking at this element, right? I'm again a slow reader. I read the head and then I sit there and twiddle my thumbs and meanwhile someone goes up and updates the head. And now I dereference the head and that takes me to this node, okay? Well, this node better stick around, right, until I'm done with it. So there's got to be a, the four here is not the number four. It's wait for readers. I could barely fit this in. So. so the updater has to wait for all current readers to be done with this in a mechanism yet to be described. Once all the readers have finished with this, okay, that's basically any reader that was in process when we switched to phase two. New readers we don't care about because new readers are getting the good value. But any readers that were in process, we need to wait for them to finish. Once they're finished, we can go ahead and know that this guy, so this guy has possible readers. Right, may have readers. This one may have readers. And this one, can it have readers? No, because we waited until all of them were gone. Which readers do we wait for? We wait for the readers prior to phase two. Right, because anything phase two and afterwards is getting new values, it's good. Once there are no readers, we can go ahead and free that node. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any up multiple update? Yes, this just deals with concurrent readers, not concurrent updaters. So concurrent updaters need to use a lock. So the model we're going to look at is lots and lots of reading and some updating. Okay, that's what we're optimizing for.
Okay. So during phase one, the readers see two items, right? Because there are two items. During phase two, new readers see one item, and the old readers may see two items. All right? Um, in this case, since we're deleting from the head, I guess they have to see two items. But if we were deleting in the middle of a list, it may be they haven't gotten to the part where we skip around it yet. Right? And then in phase three, everyone sees only one item because there are no old readers. And in phase four, of course, everyone sees one item. Questions? All right. Well, let's do another case. Modification. So here, we're actually modifying. We're trying to modify this guy. We're trying to change. In this case, I have him changing his value. Let's assume it's changing more than a 32-bit value. Okay? So we can't just change it directly by assigning to it. We're changing two fields in this. So what do we do? We malloc to create a new node. So that's the key on this read copy update. RCU, the idea is we have a bunch of readers. And to do an update, you do a copy. And so that's what we're going to do now here. We want to modify this second node. In order to do that, we make a copy of it. And then switch it out. Right? Presto changeo. So we do a malloc. No one can see this yet. We initialize the values. What do we initialize them to? Whatever these value, old values here, plus whatever we want to change. In this case, we're just changing the value. We keep the pointer too. No one can see this. And then, again, one fell swoop. We change from pointing to the old guy to pointing to the new guy. What, does this remind you of anything? This idea of making copies of what we have and changes and then making in one fell swoop a, a ZFS. Yeah, this is very much like the ZFS. Mindy, you had a question. Yes, because I, 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 I mistyped this, and I'm changing this to a 9 as well. So I'm changing both the value and the key, and so I can't do it at once. <coughs> if I was just changing one single value, you're right. But in the general case, we're updating more than one value. Yeah, this initialization may really be a copy and initialization. Yeah, copy the old data and update the data you want to change. In my case, we copied the old data, which included the pointer, and we updated the key and updated the value. Why is the pointer flipped from key to value three? Like from before the assigned pointer step to after the assigned pointer step, that top arrow is flipped. Yeah, from phase three. Yes. To phase four, yeah. yeah. Uh, is there like because you said it's an just top. an error, just an error. So thank you. Yeah, still no change there. We make exactly one change here, which is we're updating this head pointer. So new readers are going to see the new value. Old readers are going to see the old value. We can't get rid of this guy until all the old readers are done. So this is not really wait for readers. This is wait for old readers, right? Yes? So in this code, we're relying on pointer assignments being atomic, which is only true for our architecture. So if we're writing this in C, is there a way to say this code should only compile if the architecture supports like atomic, this thing being atomic? Or like more generally in like JOS or XT6, like we assume that integers are 32 bit, or like we assume this or we assume that? Or do you just kind of have to like write your code and then like know what you're doing? Uh, I 
we are going to come up with some RCU macros, macros that will be, whose implementation will be somewhat different from architecture architecture to try to capture this. And on the architectures where pointers aren't atomic, then uh, one hopes what it'll just say is assert, you know, a compile assertion error. <laughs> That, that, that it doesn't work on this machine. Okay. Could you just implement it using locks instead? Well, yes. I mean, that's the other alternative is all of a sudden we just behind the scenes drop the locks. But it's probably better to fail and tell you you're not getting this fast stuff. Yeah. So. Okay. So we wait for the readers. Once the readers are done, no one can access this guy anymore. And therefore, I ran out of room. And so time flows to the right and then down. Okay. And so then we do our free, and we're left with our head pointing to our two elements which have been changed. I was actually somewhat proud of that. <laughs> is that why the arrow is all wiggly? Unfortunately, I couldn't quite figure out how to make it really nice. But. OK, so RCU. Uh, is not a great acronym. We have a bunch of readers that we care about. Okay. <laughs> Updaters make copies and then do a single assignment to do an update. This won't necessarily work for all data structures. Okay. Any any data structure where you need to make, let's say, two assignments to update something, this isn't going to work for. It would work for something like ZFS we talked about. Or you know you can imagine uh, tree structures. You may need to make a lot of a lot of copies, but eventually you could just change the root. So you had your a question about. Yes. So we had a, a, a copy, and then its parent had to have a copy because we changed the checksum, and its parent then had a copy until we get to the root. Yeah. And then what we could do is just change that root, change what that current root is. And changing the current root, that's the one false root to atomic. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <coughs> okay. But it works great for linked lists, at least singly linked lists. We'll talk about doubly linked lists in a moment. But as you can imagine, for doubly linked lists, you need to update two things. And so it doesn't quite work. So we're going to have an API, and this is going to it's going to get crazy, I think, right? So in API, read lock and read unlock. So this is for readers. And that basically specifies what the, the read side critical section is. And the critical section is the one where the reader is using this data. So it guarantees not to use the data outside the critical section. Okay. So its traversing of the linked list should be surrounded by this read lock, read unlock. Right. It uses a dereference call. So this I'll actually just show it down here. So they specify the read side critical section, and there's some rules about a critical, critical section. You only access your RCU protected data structure during the critical section, not outside of a critical section. Okay? Only inside a critical section. Otherwise, you don't look at it. And you don't block. Right? We're talking about the kernel here. So don't go to sleep. Don't uh, yield. Don't get interrupted. Just run. We'll talk about the interrupts in a moment. Okay. In something like JOS, we don't have interrupts that are interrupting a thread where it'll get swapped out, right? So the kernel threads uh, uh, don't get swapped out. They run to completion. So, and you use RCU dereference to dereference a pointer, like the head, for example. Okay. The the pointer that is changing in one fell swoop. Okay. And you use this dereference. Well, here's what it looks like. You do RCU read lock, 
You do dereference with whatever your pointer to your data structure is. You do something with it, and you unlock. Again, no yields, no scheduling another thread in here. Yeah. No blocking. P is the, in the case of a linked list, this might be the head. Oh, and we might actually have to use this dereference, not just for the head, but for every link in the linked list. Okay. Basically, dereferencing pointers, I'm going to say not to the data structure, to and within. Okay. So that's what a reader looks like. We'll talk about implementation a little bit later. How does it work for updaters, for writers? Anything you're trying to change that the readers can't see, have at it. If you're allocating a new node, if you're writing stuff into the node, if you're setting it to point into the data structure, but nothing else points to it, go ahead. When you're assigning your pointer, like assigning the head pointer, don't just assign it. Use RCU assign pointer. So like here, for example, we can malloc a node, we can find the old value of head, we can set our values over P, and then we call RCU assign pointer that basically says head equals P. <coughs> this also will provide a write barrier and ensure that anything that happened before this, as far as writes are concerned, happens first, and then this one happens. So it prevents this out of order writing. Right. And then synchronized CPUs. That is, yeah, not CPUs, RCU. I, it was another TLA, I'm sorry. So, okay. So this provides this grace period. This will block until all the existing readers are done. So all the readers that exist at this time right now, at, at, as you start synchronized CPUs, it guarantees it won't return until every one of the readers that was running at that time is done. And by done, I mean out of their critical section. That's what we care about. Not done like the process is finished. At this point, we know no one can access old, and so we go ahead and get rid of it. So we do whatever cleanup we need to do. So, so this third is bleeding ahead and draining the basically? This one is the equivalent of the modify, yeah, right? So, yeah, it's modifying the head. It's modifying the, the first, it's, it's modifying the first node. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Andy. Does, doesn't the updater need to, like, block something uh, so that other people don't try to update the file? If there are other updaters, maybe this is the single updater in the universe, in which case there's no locking necessary. Right? If there are other updaters that might want to be doing this, you need to throw a lock around it. Just use your existing mechanisms to ensure uh, a single writer, single updater. Okay. All right, so we want concurrent reads, right? concurrent with other readers and concurrent with updaters too. We don't want to have this situation where we've got this block of time where no readers can run because we're assuming a situation where there's just a lot of reading taking place. We want low computation and space overhead. Um, we'll talk about that space overhead in a minute, um, but less is better. As, as, as it says in, in Linux, they have like 8 million uh, directory entries that they have cached that they're dealing with, and they need to deal with this concurrent reader, and so you don't want to have let's say, a 32-bit integer for every one of those, because that's a lot of memory, right? That'd be 32 meg of memory just for keeping track of directory entry locks. So we're going to have, we'll talk about low space overhead a little bit later. And we want to have a deterministic completion time for reads. That is, we want to just know, unlike, let's say, a case where you do a lock, you don't know how long you're going to have to wait, right? You don't know how long someone is going to hold on to the lock and how many other readers there are. So we want to just have this be deterministic. And that allows us to use it in things like interrupts, uh, handlers, and things like that. Okay. So on to implementation. And I like this quote. Nothing is faster than nothing. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there are a lot of ways to look at it, right? If we use greater than, we're saying nothing is faster than nothing. So maybe more appropriately, nothing is faster or equal to nothing. But it depends on how you look at it. So here's an implementation for a non-preemptive kernel, like Linux 2.4 version. So in a, in a non-preemptive kernel, the kernel thread, when you get a system call, runs to completion. Okay? It's not itself going to be interrupted for another thread. So here is the implementation of RCU read lock. Nothing. Read unlock, also nothing. But nothing is faster than nothing, so I can't get any better than this. And finally, the RCU dereference looks very complicated. All it really says is temp equals p, put in a read barrier, and return temp. Okay. The read barrier, let me try if I remember this correctly. So we want to ensure, so for a write barrier, what we're trying to do We can think of our write barrier as when you do a write, you're issuing a bunch of commands that kind of go into a queue. Okay, think of them. So we have these, these uh, writes waiting to happen. And the system, the, the CPU says, oh, it'd be quicker if we write this one first. So we'll do this one first, and this one second, and this one third, and this one fourth. So we have no guarantees of this ordering. In the case of assigning to the head, where we want that to happen last. So we will insert a write barrier here. And this barrier says you can't rearrange this with these guys. So this is going to have to be one, two, three, and then this guy's going to be after that four. So that's the write barrier. And the read barrier is very similar. And I can show you in a second what it'll do. So here, you know, read one, read R1, R2, R3, R4. And we want to ensure that some read happens before later reads happen. So an example might be. If you have some code dealing with a pointer and you say if p yeah what's my example let me see All right, where are we? We're right here. All right, so should the previous reads happen? Basically, we want to make sure that these reads have happened by the time we get to this read. And I'm trying to think of the exact case where this goes wrong in this in in here, but. One may or may not need read barriers or write barriers depending on the, uh, on the system. Okay. And the RCU just sort of sets it up appropriately. So if we go back to some code here, what does this code really look like? This code really looked like do nothing, do a read barrier as we read P, do nothing, sorry, do our something, and then do nothing. So there's no external indication when we have either entered or left our critical section. Right? So how can this possibly work? Well, here, yes. Sorry, so the lock and unlock are no ops. 
The lock and unlock are no ops. Exactly. Deterministic time, right? <laughs> Takes no time to do. All right. So how is this ever going to work? All right. and, and actually, why do we even have it? Why do we even mark those if they're going to be no ops? Um, the main reason is for the reader. So that the reader of the code can look and see this is the critical section. That is, this is the section where two things. What are the, what are the, the rules for the critical section? That, is, that defines the critical section. What can and cannot happen in the critical section versus outside the critical section? You can't say it. You're not allowed to block, and it's the only time you're allowed to access the data structure. So we're going to use those two things to figure out how to get synchronized RCUs to work. All right. And I don't know why I kept putting synchronized CPU. Any, so. If you go into VI, you could do something like this. One comma dollar sign is for every, for every line, search and replace underscore CPU with underscore RCU. Okay? Within the entirety of this presentation. So, here's the deal. We know the reader's not allowed to block. We know the reader has access to the RCU only during its critical section. So if the reader does yield, what does that tell us? It's not in a critical section. Right? If a reader yields or blocks, it's not in a critical section anymore. <coughs> Let me give you a diagram. We have a reader. Right, this is reader one. And it is running along. And we have a critical section right here. So this is its critical section. Which everyone knows because there's nothing special that happens here and here. Right, there are no ops that happen there. But if we looked at the code, we would see that's a critical section. And so here we're accessing our data structure. So this is begin, and this is the end. Can we be accessing the new structure here? No, not unless we entered a new critical section. All right. Eventually, what happens to a thread in the kernel? It yields, right? Yield, which may be right sleeping. It may be returning to user mode. Some of those things happen. One of those things. That will mark with a black. Yes? Who enforces the not being able to block in the critical section? The programmer in, uh, enforces that. It's like you could, but you should. You could, but if you do, it will you break. could, everything will break. Yes. <laughs> yes. So here's what we're saying for synchronized RCU, we can't really tell uh, exactly when they leave the critical section. But we know by the time we get to here, they must have left the critical section. All right? So this is CPU1. We have n CPUs. Let's say that the last CPU has our writer in it. So our writer does write here a synchronized RCU. Okay. If it waits until this time, we know this reader will be done. So CPU 1 is safe if we get to here. What about CPU 2? 
As long as we wait for one of these to happen on CPU 2, and let's say one on CPU 3, and then maybe one over here on CPU 4, if we do that for all CPUs, except for our own, because we know we're not in a read site critical section, if we look for the maximum of all these, we know every single read side critical section is done. We're overestimating, maybe a lot. So this grace period that we've added in synchronized RCUs may be longer than it needs to be. But we know if we wait till every other CPU has yielded, that is, we've gone into the scheduler is one way to think of it, then that is when we can say, OK, we're guaranteed. We're done. Andy. So what is the uh, PCPU that's guaranteed? Like? That's a lock. That's a lot. That's a lock issue. What if there's another CPU that's doing something completely unrelated that just happens to cause it to not yield for a very long time? We'll wait that very long time. So, yes. So, so all the, if we just went through a bunch of examples of like list modifying stuff, that is using the RCE model. That's right. That's all using the RCE model. And what this basically is doing, the synchronized RCU, that's the wait for readers. Say that again? Like, we were waiting until they all yield to like, know when they're like, out of the critical section. But they also have the RCU read on lock. So, so that also, like, if you made that indicate some way, then would that be a better way to do it? Awesome. No. Uh, nothing is faster than nothing. So, <laughs> the fastest thing we can do here is do nothing. If we try to start doing other stuff, like writing, we're getting more into this idea. So let me even back up a second. Where are we going to write it is one question. We need to, some space to write this into. Where's that going to be? Is it going to be one for every lock? There may be tons and tons of locks in our code that we don't want to, you know, to deal. So, so uh, yes, you could make this tighter at the expense of doing more in here and making it more complicated. So here's the deal. Yeah, the the reason we want to wait, the reason we want to wait, is we usually need to do some sort of cleanup. Okay, here's an example. We're waiting to know when it's safe to free this node. It's just the cleanup. The the readers are fine once you have done your assignment of your pointer. They're happy. You just have some stuff you need to clean up. And very often what you may do here, instead of synchronize RCU, there is another API call that adds a callback that just says, call me back once it's synchronized. And so you may basically just create a list of things to be cleaned up and have your callback clean it up. And then go about doing other stuff on your CPU. Is there like an asynchronous Yeah, it's the asynchronous, it's the async sync renize <laughs> RCU, yes. And the nice part about that async version is you could then go ahead and do some more writing, uh, updating with RCU, and some more of different structures or the same structures or so on. And it can all get kind of accumulated into one big uh, recognition that everything has been synchronized, and then just call all these callbacks. Um, what do we need RCU key reference and RCU assigned pointer for? Read barriers and write barriers. They really have nothing to do with this synchronization. It's really just ensuring that when I write an update head, everything else has, has, has been updated. And then, when I, and then when I read also kind of I so see the right this, stuff. You would, need this even you would need it anyway. Yeah, you would need it anyway. Uh, the other thing it does, though, is 
allow you to do some static analysis that says, gee, there is a use of dereference pointer outside of a begin end. That's clearly not OK. What do we need to read for? We got to that, and I will get back to that. OK, um, okay so how exactly does this work? How do we figure out that all these guys have yielded at least once? Uh, here's the initial way that this ran. Basically, this thread here that's in synchronized RCU, that's executing synchronized RCU, basically said, assuming we have an OS prim to do that, run this thread on another CPU. If it gets a chance to run another CPU, it knows that CPU has yielded, so it could run. And it does it again to the next one, and the next one, and the next So it basically just does a for loop saying, run me on this other CPU. And once it's run on all the CPUs, then it knows all of the critical sections are gone because they've all yielded. That's, that's, that's one way. And a, a, another way is, in the scheduler, have a CPU local variable that says how many times the scheduler has been called. So synchronize RCU. Right, let's look at an example. Here, let's say we've got our schedule count. Right, and it's 1, 3, 5, 2, 4. Yeah, we have a six CPU machine. All right? We get to synchronize RCU. Synchronize RCU reads all these. One, three, five, two, four, six. And it'll special case its own, let's say. And then, as we start hitting this schedule, and this schedule, and this schedule, and this schedule, these will increment. Let's say this does a bunch of scheduling, and this is up to eight now. Right? And this is 6, and this is 2. 2, 4, 6, 8, 6. Strictly dominates the old one. And then it knows it's done. And at this point, if we're using the async version, it can then go ahead and call any callbacks. Does that make sense? It is. Not even just non-intuitive, counterintuitive to me uh, in some ways that this works, and especially that you don't have to actually do anything in this read side critical section. But it's more a way of thinking about it that, 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 that really helps. Uh, and this amortization, again, that idea is just if we go ahead and use the async version, we can have a bunch of synchronized RCUs that all get kind of conglomerated together. All right, what if you have a preemptive kernel, like you know, Linux 2.6 and later? Okay. Well, it's a simple idea, and that is just somehow turn off preemption while you're in the critical section. That is, we're going to actually have some code in our begin and end. Okay. So in Linux, there is a preempt count, which is in each thread. And the preempt count, if it's non-zero, it says don't preempt me. And if it's zero, it says preempt me. So uh, anytime you acquire a lock in Linux, it increments that preempt count. And when you release the lock, it decrements it. So that way, you, while you're holding a lock, aren't going to get swapped out. Because that could lead to deadlock and so on. So, at least a spin lock. So, while you're spinning, it doesn't do it. Other sorts of locks it might, but not while you have a spin lock. So, RCU read lock is basically going to just take the current thread and increment the preempt count. And RCU read unlock is going to decrement it. So, this is basically um, going to be ensuring or maintaining the requirement that while you're in the middle of your critical section, you don't yield. 
Does that make sense? Okay. We talked a bit about multiple writers. You still need the write lock. Limitations. If you have an update where you can't capture it in a single, a single pointer assignment, then that won't work. So let's see if we can come up with some examples of that. Probably a doubly linked list is the best example. All right, so we have Something like that, let's say. So if we want to delete this guy in the middle, how many pointers do we need to update? Two. We would need to update this one to point here and this one to point here. Can we do that in one fell swoop? Not without a lock, but we don't want to do right, a lock. Because we don't care from an updater point of view about doing a lock. The problem is we don't want the readers to have to use locks. Right? We want the readers to just be blasting along at full speed. So RCU, no good for AA linked lists. But is this really true? <laughs> Let's say I've got a reader who is going along, and the reader is going along using the forward pointers, and never happens to use the back pointers, the pre pointers. In that case, would it matter that at one point in time we had updated this one, but we hadn't yet had a chance to update this one, right? What would the reader see? If it is only using forward pointers, here. It'll see, well, yeah, from its point of view, it's a singly linked. In fact, it's a singly linked list, and it's fine. It's just like the case where we had a real singly linked list. Since it's never looking at this, right, if it's never going to look at this, what does it care? So the rule for Linux which does use doubly linked lists with RCU is readers never go backward. So you're not allowed to iterate backwards through a list or look at the prev pointer. <coughs> All right. So let me see if I understand this. Singly linked lists work. Doubly linked lists work if you treat them like a singly linked list. So why do we have the doubly linked list? Writers can still traverse them backwards, exactly. And what good is that? Possibly. So you can still do what you could do before, which is have one thing at a time iterate both directions, but now you can also have as many things as you want iterating forward. Mm, that's true. How about this? How about an API that says list.delete node star. Right? I've got a node and I want to delete it. What's the cost of this in a singly linked list? Order O of n, because you've got to traverse the list until you find it. What about in a doubly linked list? Order one. Order one. Can I still do this? Yes, because my writer can do this. My writer can update it. My readers aren't going to be confused because they don't care. They don't have any need to go backwards. They like just traversing the list, but this can speed this up. So. Uh, by using the doubly linked list, it's order one. So that's the basic reason they have it. Make sense? Yeah. So if we need to delete a, uh, an, an item in the list, yeah. like let's say this item, yeah. if we have a singly linked list, yeah. in order to delete this item, we have to know what its previous guy is. The only way to do that is to start at the head and work your way down. 
that's order n. Yeah. If, on the other hand, we have a doubly linked list like here, in order to know what the previous guy is, we just go and look at our prev. So we're not a reader. Yeah. We're allowed to look at prev. Yeah. We're in a lock because we're an updater. No one else is messing with the list. Yeah. So we can safely find our prev and then delete this element in order one time. OK. That makes sense. Yeah. OK. Um, can we do trees? How about a binary tree? Can we support? Uh, deletion with an RCU. Deletion of a binary tree some sort of a tree Oh, yeah, don't make it bounce. That makes it hard. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, that's our step two, right? So step one is we've got this binary tree, uh, I don't know, balanced. Sorry, binary, search tree, so in order, not necessarily balanced. So, I don't know, nine or something. So we want to delete four. Guess we should have one here too. Uh, two, three. One, let's have, we need to have one here. 1.5. One, 1.5, one, two, less than, less than, less than, less than, okay. If we want to delete four, okay, so our job is to delete four and we're an updater, we would change this to null in one fell swoop, wait for all the writers, and then remove this node. Wait for all the readers and remove this node. So that's if we want to delete four. What if we want to delete three? Do we need the entire subtree from three? So do we need to copy everything down here? No, I guess you can just point to those bits. Yeah, so let's see. We have to. Yeah, we could move four up here. Yeah. Right, so let's just say we were doing that. How we would do that? We would create a four here. <sighs> I wouldn't want to inconvenience someone else. <laughs> okay, so we go four here. Four is going to point over to 1.5 here, right? And then this is our fell swoop update. Okay. If we're doing rebalancing, it gets to be fairly more expensive. You basically might have log n, right, the, the, the spine of the tree. You know, we're log n height, and we're doing these manipulations all the way up. So we may have to deal with a lot of subtrees, and we may have to have, I think it's still going to be order log n new nodes okay, that we'll have to deal with. So most of the time, you have sort of these subtrees that just move around, and we could still just move those around. For reference to Actually, let me, so let's look at this a second. This is not the way we normally delete. Let me, let me think about this a second. The way we delete, yeah, the way you delete in the case of three is you find your least greatest um, uh, child. So you go to the right and then you go to the left a bunch until you get to the bottom. And then that is the one that's going to replace you. So that has a parent which is in the tree, we need to update the pointer from that parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we exactly. So we mean, yes. That's true, that, that entire, entire, yes. So, but it, it's doable. The doubly linked list case, if you're allowing a reader to go back and forth, is not doable. All right, uh, and then the use of RCU in Linux uh, is less interesting to me than RCU itself. So uh, one interesting part, it was introduced to Linux in 2002. Okay, Paul McKinney, who wrote this paper and lots of other papers, uh, 
introduced it, got it in, sort of shepherded in, although the rate of adoption has really increased since then a fair amount. But then he did a PhD, and in his thesis basically he references, well, you know, this is one use of it where in Linux I shepherded in you know, to do this. I just think it's an interesting ordering that he did there. Uh, and it was a, it's, a certain, it's a pretty interesting thesis. Um, it has more than 10,000 know, separate occurrences in the, in the kernel, used a lot in the file system networking. There's a lot of synchronization for like directory entries, so cache directory entries. In, in terms of dealing with the file system. Yeah, the goal is you understand the intuition, how you can have this no code locking and unlocking in the read side and have this work. Uh, and a little bit of the pros and cons. Uh, if a single integer overhead, this is what they said in the, in the paper, for a read write lock is sometimes unacceptable, does that mean RCU has no storage overhead? And the answer is basically yes. Well, it has a bit of overhead in the schedule, but that's just cost. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No overhead per critical section, per, and so on. Uh, the type safe memory, we're not going to have enough time to talk about right now, but I will hope to come back to that. Um, without proper care, and this is again a quote from the, from the paper, a reader accessing a data item, an updater concurrently initialized and inserted, could observe that item's pre initialized state. So that's the case we talked about, where we changed the value of a node, and an existing reader could see the old value. And the question is, why can't it prevent this by giving the updater a lock while it's updating? And the problem is, in order for that to work, the reader would also need to be using the lock, and that's terribly expensive. So, uh, <coughs> this just shows sort of the example. Let's say head is null. And then we've got a writer that updates the A field of P to 6 and then updates head. If we've got some other thread that reads head, it could find that A is not 6 in head because it hasn't happened yet. Right? This is the idea of the uh, write barrier here, that these can be swapped in terms of when they actually happen. And that's why we need this write barrier. And it's nice that RCU provides us an explicit way to do that. Uh, why does synchronized RCU use context switches rather than scheduling a thread? Um, again, we talked about this, this asynchronous version of synchronized RCU. Um, and that's the basic idea. The deterministic completion time for read operations, really important for like interrupt handlers, where you may have only a fixed budget of time that you can use. And so waiting on a spin lock can be an unpredictable amount of time. Uh, I'll come back on Monday and just mention the type safe memory and also talk about the read barriers. <coughs> We're getting close to the end of the quarter. What do we have? Two weeks left, right? So I will, I'm going to provide a special lecture on the last day of class, uh, which I will, so you know what it's about, no one else does. So. <laughs> it is not on New Zealand, no. No. <laughs> All right, have a good weekend, guys.